been writing some fantastic narratives for the Nestle writing competition. And one thing that we've used to help us with our narratives is this narrative graph. Now I'd like you to have a good look at the narrative graph. And I want you to just think to yourself for a moment, how does that narrative graph help you? Just have a think. Now I'd like you to just tell the person next to you how that narrative gra graph has helped you. What were some of your ideas? Okay, so how has the narrative graph helped you? Okay, right at the back, Jackson. Um, well, it helps me because you know how to set all your writing out, and you want, and you told us that you need to write it on a high. Good. Okay. What do you mean by it helps us to set it out? Well, um, you've got like the introduction first, and then you've got the orientation, and then you've got have to have the complication, and then you've got the series of events next, and you've got the second series of events, and then you've got the resolution, and then you've got the reorientation. Fantastic. Can anybody think of another way that the narrative graph has helped them? Okay, Kaylee. It's helped me like how to end them because like because I wouldn't know how to like I'd probably just keep on going on. Oh, so you wouldn't come to a finish. Yeah. You wouldn't close it. You'd just keep writing. So you know now where to finish. Yep. Fantastic, Chelsea. Um, it gets. It made me understand like when it should be at its most exciting point and when it should be sort of just a bit lower so the story flows better. Fantastic. Donna? Um, it's helped me like when it says introduction and it says start with action and then orientation and then it says some other things so I know what to do. Okay. Courtney? Well, it helps you see when you're writing your story that if you come to a part you have to make it keep going up instead of like go up and then go down. What do you mean go up? Well, with the tension and the excitement. Fantastic. Andrew? Yeah, it helped me build the tension as well, like so that at the end it doesn't just drop. Yes, we had that with your first yeah. narrative, didn't we? Two. And we worked yeah. on that and helped it to keep going up on our narrative graph. Now, I want you to imagine that you've just read this exciting story. This is what's happening. Four crooks plan to steal $10 million in diamonds. They have captured the brave kids that are investigating them and their parents are searching frantically. But while their parents are searching for them, the crooks have set a fire which is raging closer and closer to the terrified captives. So the tension is building. The next sentence. And then I woke up, it was all a horrible dream. What happened on our narrative graph? If you were drawing a graph of that narrative, what would happen, Jay? Just go up and drop. And drop. Very good. It's what we call, and we've got a tip here, writing tip here, it's what we call a quick fix at the end. And a quick fix is when the writer gets to the end of the narrative and hasn't put much thought into it and thinks, hmm, how am I going to end this narrative? and just thinks, I know, I'll just add, and then, uh, and then I woke up, it was all a horrible dream. So it's a quick fix for the writer, but for the reader, it's annoying and it's boring. So we need to avoid a quick fix ending. Now, the next tip is that the resolution should always come from the main characters in the story. It should come from the outside. So you don't want to bring in a completely new character that you haven't mentioned or you've only mentioned once or twice and they come in and save the day. Because that had nothing to do with your narrative. So it doesn't make sense that a stranger would come in and save the day. You want your main characters that the reader knows lots about to come in and resolve whatever the problem is or show how your main characters have changed. So I'm going to read you two different endings that are much better than and then I woke up, it was a horrible dream. And I want you to decide which one you think is the best. Okay, so here they are. So 
what's just happened again, there's been four crooks, they've stolen $10 million in diamonds, the kids are investigating, parents are searching, but the fire is coming closer and closer to the kids who've been captured. One of the kids is a gymnast, strong and supple. She wriggles out of the ropes, tying them up, and sets them all free. The next one. Even with hands tied behind him, one kid manages to press triple O on his mobile phone and leaves the line open so the police can overhear everything and locate them. Have a think in your mind for a moment, which one do you prefer? And let's hear which one and why. Okay, Will. Um, probably the second one because the first one it just um, it just ends, and the second one it sort of it can keep going. The other one it just stops straight away. Felt like it stopped too soon. Mm. Okay, Andrew. Um, like Will said, I like the second one better because it sort of felt like that with the first one that was the resolution and you couldn't really put a reorientation on it. Okay. Whereas the um, second one, it felt like you'd go after. Courtney. Um, I like the second one because it's more exciting than the first one because like we don't know that one of them is a gymnast so how do how could she have done it if we didn't know about it? Very good so unless that was mentioned earlier in the narrative then that would be like bringing something from the outside in wouldn't it? Good point. We have a two-year cycle for writing at school and that means that we aim to cover as many text types as possible during those two years. We have a two-year cycle because the students enter the senior unit at grade five and they have two years. They're grade five year in the senior unit and they're grade six year at the senior unit. We aim to cover as many text types as possible because as the students move into the middle years they're expected to understand a wide variety of text types and they need to gain experience in these text types. At high school, they may enter, for example, a science class and they're automatically expected to be able to read a science report and to actually write a science report. The focus in these science classes is often on the content, not on actually the process of writing. So that's why we try and teach the, the students these skills before they go to high school. When students enter the middle years, they're often expected to come to terms with abstract terminology and narrative has lots of terminology that the students are trying to come to terms with. So I use a narrative graph so that they can get a visual image of what the terminology is and also they, so they can understand the different parts of a narrative. I use the tips because there's so much to a narrative that the students need to learn skills in small parts so that they can gain a really good understanding of those skills and then are able to use them. We were working on narratives at that stage because the students were entering into a Nestle writing competition, so that why, that's why it was a really good idea at that stage to be working on narratives. Today, your job with a partner is to go back, look at each other's resolutions and reorientations, and make sure that it's not a quick fix solution and they can come in all different forms. Right. Make sure the resolution is coming from the main characters. After you've had that discussion, refer back to your criteria sheet. And when you're reading your partner's narrative, have a think about those things that are on there too. You may like to make some comments about those points. Of course, you may also like to make some comments about the other tips that we've talked about. So you're making comments on the ending and other points that you think will be valuable to help that person with their narrative. Now, I'm going to have a group of people come and work with me on the floor today. And those people are going to be Daniela, Josh V, Dorna and Steph. So you will need to come and sit on the floor and the rest of you will be working independently or with your partners back at the tables. Okay, off you go. Now, what I would like you to do is to come up with two alternate 
endings to your narrative that you're writing at the moment. Now, Josh, I was talking to you yesterday and you weren't happy with your first ending. No. Uh, so we need to think about using the main characters yeah. to make you happier with your ending. Yeah. Okay? Now, you planned for the ending at the <coughs> start in your plan, didn't you? Yep. But then you weren't happy with it when you got to it. Yeah. Okay. It was a bit... It was harder than I thought. Harder than right. you thought. Mm. So we'll discuss that. Yep. The rest of you are just starting at the moment. So you're not at the point Josh is at. You're just starting to write your narratives, but we need to have those endings in mind. Okay? So just some thinking time for a moment. Have a think about two possible endings to your narrative that we can then discuss. So they're chasing after him. And then they um, corner him, and then they've got him, and they take him away, and he gets um, he gets rewarded with a medal for um, for um, bravery um, as well, um, trying to spotting the person, and then trying to um, find him, and yeah, so then that's good. Okay, what are our thoughts about that? What do we think about those endings? Daniela, what do you think? Well, <coughs> well I think um, the second one that he said was a bit better because the first one he said, it's like, um, it didn't end, kind of, it just kept going on. And then the second one, um, it actually ended and it came to a resolution and that. My one concern with, I think they're really good and they are action packed as Donna said, my one concern is about this tip here that the resolution yeah. should always come from the main characters. I thought that might be a What's your thought? Problem. Yeah, because with the second one, it also involves more of the police as well. It does, doesn't um, it? Helping instead of the main person um, having more of the part in the story. But if you look at the third one, uh, the first one, um, it's just him who really finds out and gets him. Yeah, so maybe we need a combination. You need yeah. to make, because you could have the police come into it because they probably would. Yeah. But the main part has to be from the main character. So the police would be in the background. Yeah. yeah but the yeah. main part coming from the main character. So with yours, I want you to think about, and we're going to write, after we've discussed everybody's, we'll write, and we'll see what we can come up with. I want you to think about how your main character can be the main focus. I guess I could sort of add, like have the first story when he's chasing after him, and then add the, when he gets the um, medal and all that onto that. Steph? Um, my story's about a girl named Madison. And she's like a nerd, a school nerd, and she really mm -hmm. likes homework and science. And she, um, it was in the middle of a storm and the night, and she goes to go to bed because she doesn't want to miss out on school because she'll be too tired. And her mum went to pick up her dad from work, and she went to turn the hallway light off because she was doing some extra homework. And then she touches it, and then she starts to feel her tingly up the arm. And then she goes back to bed and she starts thinking why why um did that hurt because she's a bit of a wimp and then um mm. the next day she goes to talk to a science teacher about the extra homework she did and her mouth just blabs out with um like words like rude words like hello no um she's talking to a science teacher and she goes hi science freak and then um she looks down and there's like no shadow underneath her and then she's starting to feel all tingly again then she goes back to her house and she goes into her mum's room which is dark and then she stops feeling tickly when she enters the room and then um she realizes that the shadow is nothing without light and the shadow is taken over mm. and um one of my endings are uh, that she tries to make a deal with the shadow that um, if he gets out of her, out of her body, then she will, um, wouldn't be such a teacher's pet. And then the second one is um, 
her mum went to pick up her dad from work again and then she went to turn off the hallway light and then um, the shadow, when when she touched it, the shadow disappeared because like, that's how she got it, so that's how. Oh, and that's how it disappears at the yeah. end. Okay. So the shadow is taken over or is taking over sometimes and then they're having a bit of a clash of personalities. Yep. All right, what do we think? Well, I really like the second one because it's kind of like a twist that she touches it and then her shadow comes back. It's not taking over her body anymore and I like the second one. Okay. Oh, I actually like the first one. Oh. I, like, I like the um, the thing about making a deal with the um, shadow so you lose, um, you get something and they lose something as well. Like they both, they both, it's a deal, so they both get something and they're compromising. Yeah, they're they? compromising in different ways. And um, I, I really like the story. I reckon it's really good. Yeah. yeah, I really like the first and second one, but I really think the second one is a bit better because it's like gives you more excitement. Because when you touch the PowerPoint thing the shadow disappears, it's like makes you want to read more and, and build attention it does. Okay, so we've got some different ideas there on the first or the second one. So you're really, your resolution is coming from the main characters, so that's fantastic. You just need to make sure it's not a quick fix at the end and it's one that builds attention. Okay, had our discussion, you're going to have some time now to write your endings, which one you think would be the best and then I'll come around and talk to you about those endings and we'll see how you're going. All right, so you have to decide, you've heard feedback, you have to decide based on our writing tips which direction you think you need to go. All right, off you go. I group the students for writing in a number of ways. During this session, I grouped them based on need because when I took their stories home and was reading over them, I realised that the students were having real difficulty with the resolution stage of their writing. So I needed to get those students that had that need in a group together and address that particular issue. Sometimes I also group the students in mixed ability groups and this is because students need to hear how other students think about the writing process. If they can hear the thoughts that are going on inside another student's head, it often helps those students to learn new skills. And often the way students talk to each other really connects with another student, just the way they say things. Sometimes I find a common focus for the class when I'm taking notes because all the students need practice in a particular skill. Other times I find that only three or four students may need that particular skill. So I will just get those students in a group on the floor. I really liked your story. Um, but the positives I found were um, the beginning really pulled you in because um, like you asked heaps of questions then you went back and said that like I know the answer to this because like I've experienced it and I also liked the how you referred from your mission to that movie um, the girls in rabbit proof fence like that's how you were feeling that was really good and the last sentence I liked that I'm Wally and that's my story I thought that was funny um, some improvements I thought were that um, you have talking in the last, like those paragraphs there, yeah. and you you talk, but you don't say who's talking. Like you just have the talking marks, and then you go to the next bit of talking, and it makes it confusing. So you probably should put some said Wally or you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I like your use of paragraphs. It made it fairly easy to understand. And one question I had was, when um, you when you told Uncle Douglas that you sorted it out, um, he says he was impressed, so he went and got a job. Yeah. I don't understand that. Why would he go get a job? Because he didn't want to go and get a job, but beforehand he, because he was like lazy and stubborn. But now he's um, like, he was so impressed with Wally with what Wally had done, went out and got a job for him. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense now. Yeah. Okay. And now for your story, um, this I thought that the story, well, it was well written, yeah. and it was well set out. Yeah. And the story was realistic, so like you, it could really happen in real life. So, and the you could really get the gist. 
of what it was about. Like, I didn't really not understand anything in it. It was it all made sense to me. But the ending was okay, but it could have been improved because I didn't think that it ended on a high. Yep. Because he like didn't really know what happened after he went to the detention centre. Yeah. That's sort of for you to yeah. think about. Yeah. And other than the ending, nothing else really needs improving. I often let the students choose their own partners in peer conferencing because I find it's really important that they are paired up with somebody that they feel comfortable with. In order to give constructive feedback, you need to feel comfort comfortable with that person. So the students often choose their friends or they may choose somebody who they see as a good writer and therefore they can have an open discussion about their writing. Sometimes, however, I choose two particular students to partner up together because one student may demonstrate the skill very strongly that the other student needs and then the students talking together can actually help each other in that way. It takes a long time to develop an environment where students can constructively give feedback. You have to reinforce this every single day of the year. The students need to know that the first thing they do when they're giving feedback is to give the positives what they thought was really valuable in that piece of work. Then they focus on the areas for improvement. I think it's important to teach the students how to say these, how to say this and what to say also. I find that it's really important that the students go into the process knowing that their partner is going to identify an area for improvement. That way they're expecting it and they don't see it as a negative. We've had lots of fantastic discussions about our narratives and what I'd like to hear now and what the rest of us would like to hear is how have those discussions helped you when, when writing your narratives? So who would like to go first? All right, we might start here from Amelia. Stand up please, Amelia. Um, well, what I learned about my narrative, what we discussed, um, I'm going to change my start and my ending because I learnt of Courtney, they said that my and my start and my ending was too quick, so that's what I'm going to change. Fantastic. Thank you. Courtney. From the discussion that Amelia Scott and I had, I'm going to change some of my ending and I'm going to explain a couple of parts, well the main part in my story. Oh, in my story I'm going to change a bit around the series of events where there's a bit of talking and Courtney or Amelia couldn't understand it, so I might change that, but I think, yeah, I think I'm just going to leave the rest. Thank you. Well, from the discussion Kaylee had with me, um, I've got to change a bit of a sentence to make things more clearer and I've got to erase a whole sentence. Well, in the discussion that Bianca and I had, I got to go through my story and put some more words in because I left out a few words. And yeah, well, in the discussion that Chelsea and I had, I'm going to put in some um, said Wally and all that because otherwise it doesn't make sense who's talking. Um, Jackson um, suggested that I should change my ending a bit because it wasn't as exciting as it could be so I might go through that and change that a bit. Alright Josh you were in a group with myself and three other people. Yep. What happened in the end with yours? Well in the end of um, mine my um, resolution wasn't really with the main characters, it was more part of um, the just these people that come into the story at the end and so I'm gonna actually change, I'm gonna mix my first story and my second story together to make it better and to make it a better ending. So it'll come from the main characters now. During the writing session, I look around the classroom and notice students that have done something really well that will be of benefit to share with the other students. 
Also, I usually look for students who have worked on the skill that we have introduced at the start of the session. And these are the students that I identify at the end of the share session to stand up and just share their understanding with the rest of the students. Hopefully this helps the other students in their writing. Okay, we've been discussing atlases. And so far we've discussed all the different types of information that you can find in an atlas. And we've discovered that there are lots and lots and lots of things that you can find out in an atlas. On just one page, often, there are all different parts to it. Today, however, we're going to focus on how we can easily locate information in an atlas. Now, for our homework last week, we were using north, south, east and west to help us locate places. So, could I get somebody to explain using north, south, east or west where perhaps Alice Springs is? So we can see Alice Springs there on the map. Who can use north, south, east and west to explain where that is? And maybe the states? Well, um, it's in southern, northern, in the south of the Northern Territory. Fantastic. Okay. How about we choose Broken Hill? Who can use north, south, east or west to describe where Broken Hill is? Nathan? It's in the west of New South Wales. Fantastic. So we know how to do that. I'd like you to look at that whole page and think of another way that you could explain where something is positioned on that map. Have a think for a moment. What's another way you could explain? Who thinks they've got an idea? Another way. Scott, do you have an idea? There's A, B, C, D and the uh, letters and then there's numbers up side. So if you're looking for Perth, you could say B3. Okay. Let's go back to what you said at the start. He said there is A, B, C, D and letters written across the page. Those letters are right on the bottom there. They also appear at the top. He also said there's numbers going up the page on both sides. Now if we joined those lines together, going up the page and going across the page, it would make a grid. And when we use these letters and numbers, it's called a grid reference. You're giving a grid reference and that's exactly what Scott did. Scott gave us a grid reference for Perth. Where did you say it was? B3. B3. So what would I do if Scott says B3 to me, what do I know to do, Kaylee? You put like, your finger on B and then you put your other finger on 3 and then you like do one across and one up. And hopefully come to the place. Now often when we've been reading atlases and discussing them, people in our groups have had difficulty finding the place you're talking about. So using the grid refer references can help us to do this. Could somebody else find a point on that map and use a grid reference to help us ex to help us find where it is? Have a look, see if you can come up with a place that you could give a grid reference for. Who'd like to have a go? Jackson? Oh, this is not about that. You can also find, if you go in the index, um, it'll say where if you look up the page and what um, if you look up where you want to go or something it'll say like say you're doing Perth again it would say B3 Good. and that's how it would help you excellent yes it does have the grid references in the index to help you as well now Will were you going to have a go um yeah Darwin is in E7 E7 okay so if I put my finger on 7 and go along to E and come down we find that Darwin would be in that square that that would make up. We're actually doing a unit on Australian geography and for students to fully engage in this unit they need to understand how to read an atlas. I was finding that the students were just grabbing the atlases and flicking through and thinking that that was reading an atlas they didn't really take the time to sit down and take in all the information that was on the pages. 
So I needed to work my way through this with the students and show them what skills they actually need to read an atlas because the skills are quite different to reading other texts. Your focus today when you are in your reading groups is whenever you are talking about a specific location you need to use the grid reference to help the other group members locate that place instead of pointing it out to them and instead of using north, south, east and west give them the grid reference. If you're looking for a particular place in your atlas as Jackson said if you go to the index it will give you a grid reference in the index so that will help you to locate places as well. So that's our focus for today. Now I'm going to be working with Brody, Courtney and group. So you will need to get all of your reciprocal reading things and come and sit on the floor. The rest of you will need to get your reciprocal reading things and sit in your circles around the room on the floor. Okay, off we go. Okay, we've all had a look at the map and we've written down different symbols that we've found. Now, we're going to go around, we're going to discuss the symbols that you found. However, when you're discussing one of your symbols, you need to give us the grid reference so that we can find where that symbol is on the map so that we all know what we're talking about. So the first thing you need to do is tell us what the symbol is, what the grid reference is, and then explain what you found out about that symbol. And I've noticed that some of you have got similar ones, so we'll go around and we'll get um, one from each person as we go around to talk around and we'll keep going around the circle. So if somebody else discusses one that you've got down, just put a little tick next to that one in your book so that you know that we've discussed that one. Okay, Brody, would you like to start? Mm. What's the symbol that you found? I got the, the railway thing. Okay, could you help us to find that? That's E4 right at the top. Describe it to us. It's like a line. It's got a little line to it. Mm -hmm. Very good. And that means? Um, it's a railway line. Okay, a railway line. Fantastic. Bianca, did you have one more? Yeah, I have the cross section. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. below the map there, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, very good. What does the cross section tell us? It shows us like the smooth and the roughness of our land as if it's been cut in half. Oh, okay. Do you think it's smooth and rough? Can you think of some better words? Rocky high. and high and low. High and low would probably be better. Yeah, so it's like if we took a cake and we cut the cake in the middle, we could have a look at what the insides looked like. If we took um, Australia now, let's have a look at the points that it's from. So on one side we've got South Australia and the point is the Murray River, one side of the cross section. And on the other side, we've got Sydney. So find Sydney on the map. Could somebody give me a grid reference for Sydney, please? Patrick? Uh, 3F. Yes, very good. And then we need to find the Murray River on the border. What was the border again, Brody? The symbol for the border? Um, the, the, what do you mean? Like? What's the symbol for the border? Oh, How the do we know? Line, the dotted red line. Yeah. So we need to find where the Murray River is right near that border. Can somebody give me a grid reference for that? Courtney? Um, D1 and sort of D2. Yes, but have a look down on the cross section here. So have a look. It gives us a point there, which is Sydney. It gives us another point over here, the Murray River, and they're talking about a particular point in the Murray River. And the clue it gives us, if we go down, is that we can see the South Australian state border. There. So we need to find the point of the Murray River where it's right near the South Australian border. Patrick? A2. A2. Okay. Very good. Now, that's almost a straight line between that point and between Sydney. Can you see that? Can you make an imaginary straight line in your mind? Now that cross section shows us if we cut through Australia down that way through those from those two points from Sydney to that point of the Murray River and we took away the section below, we could have a look at the height of the land and the depth of the land. And if you have a look at the cross section, we can see where the lowest points are in that line, only in that line, and where the highest points would be. So 
across that section, which would be the highest point? That's there. The Great Dividing Range. Well done, the Great Dividing Range. And the lowest point that we can see on that cross section? The Murray River. Yes. Okay, fantastic. So there are so many different symbols on a map. And we need to know what all the lines are and what all the symbols are to make sense of those. And you've made a great start with all your notes there today. Well done. During a previous session when I was taking notes, I actually noticed that this group were really rushing through their reading. They would open a page of the atlas and if they worked out where it actually was, they thought that they had read the page. So we really needed to slow down this process and get the students to focus on all the information that was contained on the page. Would anybody like to predict what Just we're going to learn the in these pages? Yep. I think that we will find some of our tallest mountains in China and in Asia. We'll do clarifying words first. So did anybody have any clarifying words? Yes, I did. Um, I had confrontation. Okay, anybody... I didn't know what that means, so I'm going to do Would you like to tell us where that is in the um, atlas? It's, not. it's just yeah. there. Wait, there. So it's, in, it's on page 68 and it's in the um, second bit of the writing. On the second line. Can anyone yeah. help him without looking it up? Um, doesn't that mean that when you confront someone you're sort of, a, sort of a, attacking them or something, sort of, yeah. but not always in a physical way. It's sort of like if you confront somebody, you like tell them the truth or something, but you'll look it up anyway so you can understand it. While he's looking that up, did anybody else have any words? Yeah, I had restoration. Okay, where's that? That's in the second. Uh, para in the second bit of writing yep. on page 68. Yeah. Yep. All right. Someone want to look that up? Okay. Yeah. Um. I know what the con conf confront means. It means to come or bring to face to face, especially in a hostile way, or to be present and have to be dealt with. Okay. Okay. Yep. So what are you looking for? Restoration. Okay. Did anybody else have a word? I didn't have one. Yeah. I had one. Um, densely, and it's not densely. a capital D. Densely, yeah. Where is it? It's in... Um, it's in the world's largest continent. Yeah, it's... It's it yeah, also the yeah. world's most densely populated continent, with a total population es estimated at 3,000. 513.2 million people. Okay. Alright, I'll look it up. I found the word. Densely means thick, packed, close together. Okay. So, it'd be like houses, like side by side. Okay. It's like they wouldn't have a backyard, it'd just be a house, a house, a house, a house. Okay. Yep. Andy? I found restore and it's got restoration underneath it. Some, bring something back to its original condition, and number two is put something back in its original place. Did anybody have any interesting facts? Yes, I did. I I found out that Asia is actually the largest continent in the world. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I've got some. Um, the life expect expectancy of people in Afghanistan is 43 years, and Japan's life expectancy is 80 years, and there are 32.3 million people living in Tokyo. Um, I found out that Mount Everest is in Nepal. I didn't actually know it was there, and um. I found out also that Nepal is the poorest country around Asia and Japan is the richest and yeah. And I also had the same one as you Annie because I didn't know where Mount Everest was so now I do. So yep. Does anybody have questions? Yep. In the picture of Mount Everest, just down here, is there 69? Yeah, view of Mount Everest from Pangolin Pass. Um, it's um, white, the mountains, but on the map it's red. Why is that? It's on the map. That's yeah, just like on the picture it's is white, and on the map here, it's red. The little dot that's black. 
No, no, no. The red bit means. Oh, the brownie bit. That's yeah. just how high the Himalayas are. Oh, it's, oh, that's the it's got a graph. Oh. Yeah. And that's just snow on top of the mountains. Alright. Did anybody have another question? I didn't know. <laughs> um, can somebody tell me what um, P and G stands for? P and G. It's what in, page? It's on um, the one with the graphs. It's um in the yeah, pie yeah, graph. Okay. And so, does anybody else have any other questions? No. Okay. Do you have any other questions? I don't have any questions. Okay. Okay. You want to summarize? Okay. Um, we learnt um that Lyle learnt what PNG stands for. And we learnt that um, what the colour meant for Mason because he was confused. And yeah. Someone. Ooh. Right, that's that. Yeah. And we learnt um, what Australia's major trading p partners are, um, and where Australians help people, like yeah. where we use our aid. And the most biggest place was Papua New Guinea. Yeah. I introduce reciprocal reading as a whole class. We use a big book and we go through the process with this big book. So I talk to them about the different sections of reciprocal reading. We talk about the introduction, we talk about clarifying, we talk about finding facts, questioning and summarising. We go through it all together, then I let the students work in their groups and usually I do that in a really whole class way as well. The groups are all sitting around and I start by giving them all the same text and we go through each of the stages. So I say now we're going to predict, now we're going to question. Then once they get used to the routine that's when they have the separate books for separate needs and that's when I can take my focus group. I got my idea for roles in reciprocal teaching from a book I actually read while I was at university and it was called The Collaborative Classroom and in that it really talked about to get groups to work in a successful way each person in the group needs to have a role. That way you don't have the situation where one person, the most dominant person, is taking over all the time and when another person is sitting back and going along for a ride. During thinking time, that's when the students are reading, they actually write down in reciprocal reading books words that they need to clarify with their group after the thinking time and also facts that they've learnt. This way, if they've got it written down, they don't have to recall it off the top of their head. They can refer to their reciprocal reading books and share their thoughts with the group. It also helps me because I am with a focus group during this time, but I collect all of their reciprocal reading books at the end of the lesson, and therefore I can see what the students have been thinking about during that session. Okay, we've come to the end of our reading session and we'd like to hear back from some of the groups to see what they've been discussing and what they've learnt. So we'll start with the group that was with me. So Courtney, could you lead us off please? Well, what we did was we looked at page 34 on New South Wales and what we had to do is we had to look at all the um, symbols that there were and one of the symbols that I had was the rivers and that all the rivers are in blue and also the name of the river is in blue and all the things to do with water are also in blue. Thank you. Patrick, could you follow on? Uh, well, I was with Courtney yeah, and one of the ones I did was the mountains and they're represented by a black triangle. Thank you, Pat. One of the symbols we found was the railroad symbol, which is just a black road sort of thing with line, little smaller black lines through it. One of the symbols we also found is a heart and it's a little symbol with colours on it and there's blue and browns and they show how high or how deep the water or mountains are. Okay. Yeah. Um, we did, we, oh, um, I, we also found the, um, the state border symbol which is the red dotted line. Another group.
Well, um, I was the leader, and we read um, from Australia and Asia, page by Australia and Asia, and um, a word of a fact that we had was that the life expectancy of people in Afghanistan is 43 years, and Japan's life expectancy is 80 years. Well, I was the manager, and I'd like to say thanks to my group members for not making it hard for me because I didn't have to give, give out any warnings at all. And I especially like to point out Andy because he was the quietest. <laughs> I was the reporter, and um, one of the facts that w that we got was that um, Mount Everest is actually in Nepal, and we, uh, me and Charles didn't know that. I was the observer and timekeeper, and. Yeah, as the observer, I was looking for contributions to the discussion, and everyone contributed well, but Nathan, I thought, stood out, because he was always adding his thoughts. Reading share time is different than writing share time, because during reading share time, I actually get each student to share something they've learnt during that session. The purpose of the reading share time is to get students to reflect on their learning and also to articulate their understandings during that session. Therefore, they leave the session with a thought in their mind about what they have learnt and it's not lost within the activities or the tasks that are going on during the session. In the middle years, literacy and the standards that the students need to reach really jump what they need to read is more difficult and they are expected to write in a more complex manner. It's my role as a middle years teacher to be explicit about how the students can do this, to teach them how they can read more difficult texts, to teach them how to write more difficult texts. One of the pedagogies that comes through in my literacy teaching is the explicit quality performance criteria. This comes through in a number of ways. The writing tips that I use with the students, I make them very explicit. I write them on the board and I also refer to them often throughout the lesson. There's a leader sheet in the reciprocal teaching that the students use and this makes the process of reciprocal teaching explicit to the students. Back to writing, I also have a narrative criteria sheet that I give to the students and this makes explicit the different parts of the narrative and the different skills the students need to develop to successfully write a narrative.